Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll, tar I'll try not to eat too much on your lunch time. I know we are a bit over time. Um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to, to tell you about this work. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm, I'm going to tell you about a methodology that we have been developing uh, uh, to try to construct controllably low energy effective models of materials. This work has been, uh, most of the things that I'm going to be showing today uh, is work that has been doing, that, that has been done by me, Shivesh, Brian, and Lucas mostly, okay? Uh, right, so the, the next few minutes I'm going to start by telling you in more detail what I'm trying to do here. Uh, then I'm going to give you a concrete example to try to uh, convince you that this is important and relevant. And then I'm going to tell you about this technique that we have been developing and which we name density matrix unfolding. And in the end, I'm going to show you some applications of this, okay? So this is our acknowledgement uh, regarding this work. Right, so what do we want to do here? We are really trying to construct models, effective models of materials, explicitly interacting if needed, okay? Especially for strongly correlated materials. Things like the Hubbard model, the TJ model, the Heisenberg model. And we want to know if these models, these kind of models that theoreticians like so much uh, to study uh, correlated materials, if these models are really applicable to real materials, and uh, if they are, to which materials uh, each model is applicable to, okay? Moreover, we want to know what are the values of these parameters here and how in practice can we manipulate these parameters to go, for instance, between one phase to another, okay? So this is the kind of things that we are interesting, interested in doing here. Uh, we are not, uh, okay, so, okay, oh, okay, so, yeah. So we are not really doing things like k.p or one yearization uh, seems to be a bit slow, sorry, okay. Or one yearization, those are models where we are feeding a non-interacting model from, for instance, a, a brand structure. We are doing something different. We are trying to include explicitly interactions uh, in these models. Okay. Uh, okay, an example with graphene, probably, I assume most of you know what is graphene. Uh, carbon atoms are arranged in a, in a honeycomb lattice. I here only represent an hexagon. Uh, the active atomic orbitals in this material are essentially the PZ orbitals that I represent here in this way. So they hybridize electrons. Uh, we have one electron per PZ orbital. We can think of this electron uh, as jumping between neighboring, uh, first neighbor orbits. And you can write uh, in a simple way a tight binding model here written in second quantization uh, language uh, where essentially I am allowing for the electron to be destroyed in one position and being created in the next, uh, in the neighboring position, okay? So essentially the electron jumps from here to here. And here I have a parameter, this hopping parameter, that in graphene people always assume by comparing to experiments that it has this particular 2.70 uh, EV uh, value. Okay, uh, we can solve uh, this model, uh, diagonalize this Hamiltonian, we get this band structure. Uh, in graphene, we have, uh, if graphene is undoped, we have uh, the lower band completely filled. Our Fermi level crosses exactly at these touching points here that we call direct fermions. And then if we look closer around these points, um, we have a conical dispersion relation here that tells us that low energy excitations in this material are just massless Dirac fermions in two plus one dimension, okay? Uh, right, we can do experiments. For instance, I'm showing here an ARPIS uh, experiment that shows uh, here the 
region of the cone, and things seem to work well with this sort of model. Okay, but I can now ask, what, uh, how can I add uh, electronic interactions to such kind of model, okay? I can say, uh, let's do the simplest thing. We can add, for instance, a Hubbard term that essentially penalizes uh, our system whenever two electrons are sitting on the same PZ orbital. If we have a double occupancy, I can even add uh, another term that is a Coulombic term, a long range interaction term, uh, resulting from having electrons in, in, the, clo in, in, in the close vicinity of, uh, of uh, uh, in space, okay? Uh, so we expect that this term is there in the case of graphene because uh, despite graphene being a semi-metal, the Coulomb interactions, the long range Coulomb interactions are not going to be that strongly screened uh, because we have nothing below and nothing above that uh, sheet of graphene. Right, uh, the question now is what are the values of these T, U, V, I, J uh, parameters in a real graphene sample? You may argue, okay, this is non-universal physics and indeed it is a non-universal physics kind of question, but nevertheless it's a question that is important in practice. Let me try to motivate that. This is a phase diagram uh, for this model that I've just shown you. Uh, this, this phase diagram was obtained doing quantum Monte Carlo calculations of that model. Let me describe it. Along this direction, we have the strength of the short range Hubbard-like interaction. And along the, this direction, we have the, the strength of the long range Coulomb tail uh, uh, in the material. So we have a quantum phase transition line along this direction where we go from a semi-metallic uh, phase in this region into a mott insulating phase where we have an antiferromagnetic uh, order uh, as I try to represent here. So now consider that we have a graphene sample on top of a sil silicon carbide, uh, silicon oxide, sorry, uh, substrate. Imagine that we are here and you want to try to bring this graphene sample closer to the uh, phase transition and eventually cross into the mott insulating phase. What do we do? At first we can think, okay, let's try to increase the uh, Coulomb interactions in our system so that uh, we cross into this strongly uh, correlated insulating phase. So we bring the graphene sample from the silicon oxide substrate in, onto a, uh, a suspended uh, situation. So we are going to be decreasing the screening uh, of our electron interactions in that way. So if we do that, what happens is that we move along this direction. So we essentially are screening less the long range tail of uh, the Coulomb interaction and we are going to move along this direction uh, roughly, right? So in fact, in this case, we have, we moved further away from the phase transition. So in fact, it's not what we wanted, right? So how do we go closer to the phase transition? So we have to uh, increase the Coulomb, the, the Hubbard-like inter interaction. And we can do that essentially straining our graphene sample isotropic, isotropically. And uh, that is going to essentially increase the, the ratio between the Hubbard interaction and the hopping, and that's the quantity that's really important. And we are going to move closer to this phase transition. Our prediction in these works was that uh, uh, we would cross this phase transition around 15% strain. That is a huge strain. Probably graphene would uh, break before we get in there, right? Right, this is interesting. Uh, the issue is that this is strongly dependent on the model that we are going to be using to, to try to model this graphene, right? This happens a lot in, in condensed matter physics, uh, especially probably the most uh, prominent case where this happened is the field of unconventional superconductivity where there's thousands of theoretical modelings of these materials and the discussion goes around for many, many years. So we would like, if possible, 
to try to controllably construct from a first princi principles uh, um, accurate calculation uh, models, effective models of these materials. Right? So let me tell you about a few methods that try to do this. Uh, and uh, then I'll start telling you about the method that we are developing that we think is, uh, is uh, more accurate, right? So the, the first thing we can try to do is essentially trying to infer from first principle calculations uh, an effective model, for instance, uh, do qualitative numerical experiments like uh, trying to converge in a DFT calculation different magnetic orders and then try to extract from that an exchange interaction for a given model that would describe the magnetic uh, ground state and low energy excitations of that model, right? We can also apply this Ludwig, uh, Ludwig uh, downfolding that essentially consists of um, doing a set of uh, uh, unitary transformations on our Hamiltonian so that we separate the low energy and uh, high energy regions of our Hilbert space. That's nice, but the issue is that we cannot really apply that to real materials, only to very simple uh, model Hamiltonians uh, because it's quite heavy and uh, difficult to do. Another thing, as I mentioned before, is to do a one yearization of a band structure. Essentially, I do a mean field calculation like DFT and then try to fit a non-interacting model, a kinetic energy only model, uh, to that band structure. That's also not what we want because we want to include, include explicitly interactions in our model, if, if especially for strongly correlated systems. Uh, and this method constrained random phase approximation kind of does that. They do a one of a band structure and then they, on a second step, try to include uh, interactions by basically integrating out uh, the effects of electrons on uh, very low energy bands and very high energy bands, okay? The issue is that they do that only using perturbation theory on a set, a specific set of diagrams, RPA. They do that because that's treatable mathematically, uh, but in, 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 some case, in, in some cases, as we might expect, that fails because other uh, diagrams that are important in this uh, integration are ignored by this technique. Uh, this other technique, constrained function renormalization re group, essentially does the same as the one above, but now treats all the diagrams uh, uh, properly. The issue is that it's really computationally heavy to do, and people, so far as I know, up to this day, can do like a three-band model system, not a, a real have an issue many-band uh, system. Right, our uh, technique that we call density matrix downfolding, we call it that because essentially use density matrices to construct this effective model. The idea is that we are going to be sampling the low energy space uh, of our uh, system with ab initio techniques and then try to use these densities, the density matrices to construct an effective model that uh, uh, has a low, uh, 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 that matches at, in this region of low energy the, the ab initio system. Let me try to uh, give you the general idea of uh, what we are trying to do. So in this figure, I essentially represent the energy functional of the ab initio system. Here I have the energy, and along this line I represent, I try to represent the low energy Hilbert space, while along this line I try to represent the high energy Hilbert space. So the, our energy functional is like a valley along this uh, low energy region. Right? So we are solving, we obtain this energy function by solving uh, the ab initio Hamiltonian. Right. What we are going to do is to find a way that I'm going to tell you in a couple of minutes uh, of generating wave functions along this low energy region of the Hilbert space. And with that set of wave functions, uh, okay. These points here are different wave functions. 
we, we will be able to sample this low energy functional that now I represent here. So this, now this plane here is the plane of the low energy Hilbert space. Now my energy function has, has this form. Now I'll try to fit a new functional that approximates this, this one. Uh, and that is uh, generated by an effective model that I write here in second quantization uh, in a very general form, okay? So essentially I'm going to be trying to do a fit between this energy functional at low energies from the Abin issue and the energy functional of the effective Hamiltonian uh, using these same low energy wave functions that I generate uh, in this low energy Hilbert subspace. Right? So how do we do this technically? We use uh, Abin issue uh, methods like quantum Monte Carlo in real space. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you any technical about these sort of methods. I, I, I just uh, want you to think about these methods as a way of projecting a trail wave function, like this one here that is high in energy into the low energy space, right? So we start with the trail wave function here, we iterate the Monte Carlo, and we go down in energy close to this low energy uh, Hilbert space, right? So we have different sorts of Monte Carlo techniques that allow us to do this. Uh, each one of them has different advantages. Right, once we generate a few uh, wave functions in this low energy space, we do a linear regression trying to match the ab initio functional and the effective functional, right? Uh, basically, things in blue are things that we can calculate from the, this quantum Monte Carlo techniques. The total energy, the, the, the energy expectation value of that low energy wave function. And here, the matrix, matrix elements of this one body and two body reduced density matrices. Okay, so these kind of expectation values. And then to match one with the other, we just have to do a linear regression to determine these uh, parameters of our model. That's the basic idea, okay? Uh, right. Uh, how to do that in practice? We have essentially three steps that we have to take care of. First thing, we have to find the low energy space, okay? We have to generate wave functions on that low energy space. Uh, then we have to find a good local basis to write our effective model uh, on, okay? And then we have to find the descriptors, the matrix elements of these one and two body density matrices that are most relevant, most important uh, on our feet, okay? Right, this first task is crucial. If we don't sample the low energy space, we are not going to have a good low energy effective model of that material. I'm going to tell you, we have developed a few techniques to do that. I'm going to tell you about one in the next slide, this orthogonal optimization. The second task, finding uh, a good basis. We have some freedom of, of choice in, 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 that, in, in choosing that basis, but it's important to choose a good basis, otherwise our effective model is going to be very complicated with many, many terms, and we, we won't be able to do anything with, with that, okay? So we have to be careful on doing that, and most, many times use intuition, physical intuition, to, to do that choice. And the third task, uh, we can accomplish that with well-established statistical analysis uh, tools. And I'm going to show you some examples uh, of uh, good fits. Right, first task, this orthogonal optimization technique. We just, again, want to sample this low energy space. I'm here uh, representing, again, this low energy space. Now. This direction is essentially the overlap between a trial wave function and the true ground state of our system. Along this direction, I'm representing the overlap between that wave function and the first excited state. And here, along this direction, we have the energy, right? So you can imagine that the low energy manifold of our uh, system is like a plane that goes from the total overlap 
with the ground states to total overlap with the first, with the second, and so on, okay? So to find an approximation to the ground state, we just need to minimize this kind of functional that we call F0. So Fn is uh, this term with a lot of uh, terms here that I'm going to show in practice in a, in, a, in a minute. But OK, for the ground state, I just have to minimize this expectation value of the energy, uh, optimizing a wave function so that it gets as close as possible to the real ground state. If I want to approximate the first excited state, I essentially minimize the expectation value of the energy and the overlap between the, my approximation to the ground state. In that way, you can, thinking a little bit, really, uh, rapidly conclude that the wave function that minimizes the energy and the overlap with the ground state must be the first excited state, right? So we are going to approximate this first excited state. If you do that now for the second excited state, uh, we just have to, in addition, minimize the overlap with this wave function approximating the first excited state, and we are going to go down there, right? And with these three points, we are already define this low energy uh, manifold, right? Uh, okay, five minutes. Uh, right, we can even set, using this term here, uh, target overlaps uh, and generate wave functions along these regions in, in this uh, low energy space. We have tried this in a small system, benzene. Uh, here we show some results for the excitation energies of benzene. Here is the exp uh, experimental energies. Here is the energies that we got. Most of them are within tens and hundreds of milliEV uh, of distance for benzene. Okay, so the results are encouraging. Uh, using this method. Right, let me accelerate a little bit. Choosing a basis, the second task. Uh, choosing a basis, we usually like to work in local basis. There's techniques like one-year functions, uh, maximally localized one-year functions that allow us to do that. As I said, it's important to choose uh, a good basis. Uh, otherwise, our one and two-body reduced density matrices, these terms here, uh, are going to be, uh, so the, the, those matrices are not going to be sparse and we are going to include a lot of them in our Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian, and that's not good because that renders it untreatable. So a compact wave function resulting from a good choice of basis, it's going to give a simpler Hamiltonian uh, and that's what we want. The third task, we can, uh, assume that we have sampled the low energy space, and now we want just to find which of these uh, matrix elements of the reduced density matrix that are most important in fitting this uh, low energy uh, space. To do that, we can use statistical analysis tools. Here I'm showing just one possibility, this method named orthogonal matching pursuit that successively finds the descriptors that are most correlated with the ab initio energy. So here I'm just trying to represent that. So here is the energy of the model. Here is the energy of the ab initio calculation. And if both of them match our wave functions that are these points are going to align along this diagonal line. So whenever I just construct a model, in this case the one that is mostly correlated with the energy is the upper term. So if I have a model just with this upper term, my wave functions are really not along this line, so our model is bad. When I fit the second parameter in our model, I fit the hopping term, so I have a upper model, and now the wave functions are lining uh, along this uh, system. So this is a, I forgot to say, hydrogen chain with 10 atoms at this 1.8 angstrom distance. So including more interaction, more terms in our Hamiltonian seems to not change a lot our things. We can now assess the quality of, of our model by looking, for instance, at uh, the R square, statistical quantities that give, uh, uh, that tell us about the quality of our fit. And we see 
write out that in this case, the R square is very small. Once we fit the second term in our uh, model, we, we go very close to, to one, so our model gets really nice. So this is a really nice thing to have a systematically improvable model because we can access the model quality of our uh, Hamiltonian. Right, uh, here I just show for this particular case the model that we got. Uh, so we have a TU model with these values for the parameters. We have error bars and essentially we have like a representation of our Abinitio system that is a Hubbard model with these two parameters. Okay, uh, let me just show you some uh, scattered results. Again, for the 10 atom hydrogen chain, uh, what I'm showing here is essentially the space of the Hubbard descriptor and the hopping descriptor with energy here, and each of these points are wave functions that were generated in using different methods. And we, what we have is that all these wave functions are lining on this plane. So with these two descriptors in this particular system, we really found the low energy uh, manifold and uh, uh, this kind of model is good enough to describe this low energy model. If we choose uh, a different set of, let me, okay, a different set of descriptors, now I'm using the descriptor for the hopping and the exchange, uh, Eisenberg exchange term, like a TJ model, we see that our wave functions don't align along this plane, so we are not describing well this low energy manifold with these two descriptors, so our model is going to not be that good. Okay, here I'm showing results for H2 molecule. Uh, basically, what I'm comparing here is, a, is the values of the eigenstates of the system, so the ab issue system, I did a exact diagonali diagonalization of the ab issue uh, in terms of the distance between the hydrogen atoms, and we have these uh, wave, uh, these uh, energy levels, so just to tell you, this is not a band structure, this is energy uh, uh, eigen, eigenvalues of our system in terms of the distance between hydrogen atoms. And on red, I do an exact diagonalization for the model that we got using this technique that I've been telling you about. So this, the, in this case, the model is a T-only model, so a hopping electrons are not interacting. Uh, they are just hopping between the two, two atoms. And we get a good description of the lowest energy uh, level, the ground state, but then the other energy levels are not that good uh, described. If I go to a TU model, a Herbert model, then this low energy uh, subspace is really uh, well described with this kind of model. So this is just a, a way of, of comparing uh, if the model is good when comparing eigenstates with the, between the model and the, and the Abin issue calculation. Right, just to close, uh, ongoing work, we are trying to do this for graphene. Uh, in graphene, we get this uh, T value and this U value. Um, and in HBN, uh, as a first step towards transition metal decalcogenides, uh, we get this T, this U, and here is essentially the gap, the mass term in our system that is around that value. We are now going to try to get uh, the VIJs, the Coulomb tail for these systems, uh, because we really want to, when we go to transition metal decalcogenides, be able to, for instance, look at uh, things like uh, uh, excitants and stuff like that with this uh, uh, Coulomb interaction. All right, just a few final comments. Uh, okay, this density matrix downfolding starts from an accurate point, Quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, you can find the low energy manifold. All parameters are treated on equal footing. Uh, we can assess the quality and systematically improve our models. Uh, it's a promising technique because it's highly accurate, but Quantum Monte Carlo is expensive, right? So that's a tricky thing. Uh, in principle, we can use cheaper methods uh, provided that we can 
compute those reduced density matrix that are the workhorse of our work. In the future, we hope to ex we expect to be able to do correlated materials, including electron-electron, spin-electron, electron-phonon interactions, uh, eventually be able to investigate microscopic mechanisms and, and phase diagrams and so on, okay? Uh, Multi-scale modeling is also something that we expect to be able to contribute to. Okay, that's all people. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Yep. So thanks for the nice talk. So I was just wondering how the, in your hydrogen chain, how do the parameters depend on the system size? I mean, you did it for 10, so, so I was curious. And I mean, how does that translate in the values you got for graphene, for instance? Yeah, so that's something that we are still dealing with, I would say. Uh, in principle, what we have to do is to check for the dependence of our parameters on the system size, right? But at the same time, we expect that the physics is local, right? Uh, after some given critical system size, we expect that our parameters are not going to change because so that's an assumption that we are working with. If that's, that doesn't hold, then we, are in, we have problems, okay? But that's our expectation. Nevertheless, we still have to do a careful uh, study of, of, of that dependence, okay? Cool. Does your method work for systems with spin? Yeah, sure. So, this is all spinful uh, system. So we do a dab in issue calculation. With the, we work in the SZ uh, uh, spin uh, approach. And uh, we hope that when we start looking at uh, spin orbit coupled materials, the quantum Monte Carlo uh, methods are uh, already mature enough that allow us to, to work in the uh, non-SZ uh, spin approaches, okay? But, yeah, but for sure. Just quickly, uh, you use the energy to, to do the fitting. Yes. Um, do you think using other properties might help uh, give a better model building? So it, we use the energy, but not only the energy. We use these reduced density matrices. Uh, so it's a bunch of expectation values, right, on, on a given basis that we have chosen, but that encodes much more information than just the energy, right? Yeah, but the criterion is the, still the energy. You yeah, could use, I don't know, some other correlation function. Yeah, so the criteria that tells us if the model is good or not is, is, is the energies for the expectation values of the ab issue or the model, right? So we haven't really tried other, uh, um, other expectation values, but in principle, you can use other ones, yeah. Thank you. Cool. So I guess let's thank Nuno again. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, we'll come back at 2.30. Uh, now it's lunchtime. Thank you. <laughs>